Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and joining me to introduce today's podcast is the man behind the curtain, Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests who appear on STEM Talk. Hi, Don. Great to be here. So today we have Dr. John Ioannidis, who's returning to STEM Talk to discuss his extensive research into the COVID-19 pandemic. And over the past two decades, John's research has earned him a global reputation as a physician and as a researcher, and he's been described as one of the most influential scientists alive. In today's interview, we talk to John about COVID-19 and the largely bungled government response to it. We also have John walk us through his most recent peer-reviewed paper, which found that the pre-vaccination fatality rate for those infected may have been as low as 0.03% for people under 60 years old and 0.07% for those under 70 years old, far below the World Health Organization's touted prediction of 3.4% fatality. So John is a professor of medicine, epidemiology, and population health, as well as a statistician and a professor of biomedical data science at Stanford University. And back in 2018, when we interviewed John on episode number 77 of Some Talk, we talked to him about his 2005 paper that questioned the reliability of most medical research. And that paper was titled, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. John's study found that much of the medical science reported in peer-reviewed journals is flawed and cannot be replicated. And that paper is the most cited article in the history of the Journal of PLOS Medicine and has been viewed more than 3 million times. Before we get to our interview with John, however, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews. As always, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and other podcast apps for the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. If you hear you review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review is from a listener named Liz. It reads, I loved the interview with Jeff Volick. Even though I know the kids' jank diet is quite popular right now, I've been reluctant to try it because there is still a lot of opposition to it. But after listening to Volick, I feel much more comfortable and prepared to cut my carbs and give the diet a go. Thanks for an interview that addressed my concerns. Well, thank you, Liz, and thanks to all of our other Stem Talk listeners who helped Stem Talk become such a great success. Okay, and now on to today's interview with Dr. John Ioannidis. STEM Talk. 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 Hi, welcome to STEM Talk. I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and joining us today is John Ioannidis. John, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for the very kind invitation. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Yeah, and also joining us is Ken Ford. Hello, Don, and hello, John. Hello, good morning. So, John, as I said, welcome back to STEM Talk. And a lot has certainly changed since you were on the show back in 2018. And Atlantic Mag- Magazine actually said that you're perhaps one of the most influential scientists. If so just years later, and in early months of COVID-19, you became public enemy number one. <laughs> so it's a big shift. Um, <laughs> and, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. But is it fair to say this five years has been a, a rather wild ride for you? Uh, that's probably one uh, good way to put it, although I think that the personal adventure is uh, completely negligible compared to the great adventure that our whole world uh, went through. Hmm. It's a great way of looking at it. <laughs> um, so, John, when you were on the show in 2018, we touched a little bit on how you were trained at Harvard and Tufts Universities in internal medicine and also in infectious disease. And something that we actually failed to ask you in that first interview uh, was what led you to focus on infectious disease? I think that infectious disease is uh, is a wonderful specialty or subspecialty. It deals with uh, the entire spectrum of medicine in terms of uh, differential diagnosis because all the non-infectious diseases are always uh, in the possibility of, of being there along with infectious diseases. At the same time, it's very close to epidemiology. It's very close to public health. It's uh, something that actually was very prominent at uh, the time that I was thinking about where to train on because we had an ongoing pandemic. We, we had uh, HIV that had a, a very clear and a major presence in, in my life. Half the hospital at, at Harvard was pretty much patients with HIV infection uh, and, and not doing very well. That was uh, before we had the development of highly active antiretroviral treatment. Well, let's fast forward to 2019. 
when news about the emergence of COVID-19 cases in China first really started to appear in the media. Do you remember what you thought when you first heard reports coming out of China about the virus? What, what was in your mind when you first heard about it? It was really worrisome. But uh, what was even more worrisome was that uh, lots of pieces in that story did not make full sense. It was very unfortunate that the flow of information from China to the rest of the world seemed to have been interrupted or perhaps subverted. And, you know, subsequently, we found out that unfortunately, many people who were vocal in the early days of the pandemic in China were, were punished very harshly. And unfortunately, it was just pieces and fragments of information that made me very worried. That, but at the same time, I said, uh, you never know uh, what might be going on. Let, let's see what uh, what is happening and try to, to see if uh, some better data might emerge, or maybe we could collect some better data. Back in March of 2020, really early on in the pandemic, you jumped into some pretty hot water. You wrote a piece questioning the highly touted 3.4% fatality rate that was associated with COVID-19 at the time, and you felt that that fatality rate was substantially inflated. You wrote that although you thought COVID-19 was a serious threat, you didn't think it was behaving like the Spanish flu or a pandemic that would lead to a 3.4% fatality rate. What did you see early on that made you feel that the fatality rate was substantially inflated? My main concern at that time, and the reason why I wrote that piece, was that uh, we were moving into a danger zone. Uh, we had clearly a pandemic. We had a major threat. And uh, we were reacting in a major way with the possibility of uh, causing substantial extra harm, even beyond what the pandemic itself might uh, be causing just due to the infection. So I, I was struggling to understand what the infection fatality rate might be, because obviously this is a key determinant in terms of uh, what would be the mortality impact uh, of such a, a major pandemic. And what I said is that we need better data. We need more reliable data because major decisions need to be made. And it's not just a matter of uh, just a few days or a couple of weeks. Uh, a pandemic, once it gets established, is not going away in a couple of weeks. It's something that lasts for several years. So we need to, to guide our decisions with the best possible evidence. And understanding the infection fatality rate is, is a key priority. The data that we had already suggested a substantially lower number compared to that 3, 4 0.4%, which was a case fatality rate based on early data from China. And the reason for the lower estimate was that, uh, for example, data from cruise ships, we, we had pretty good documentation of uh, what fatality would uh, look like. And we had uh, also some good evidence about the structure of the population. My calculations going backwards from what we were seeing there suggested that most likely at a population level, a population like what we see in a high-income country, probably would be somewhere between 0.05 to 1%. And I gave an example in the mid-range of what it would be if we had an infection fatality rate of 0.3% and what that might translate to. Now, 0.05 to 1% is is a very large range of uncertainty. It's 20-fold uncertainty. And I urged to get better data as quickly as possible because uh, that would make a huge difference if it's uh, something in the low range or in the upper range. Yeah. So speaking of the data, the data that was collected in the first three months of the pandemic was, and, and this is me quoting you here, utterly unreliable, as you've talked about already a little bit. And you wrote that we had no good way of knowing how many people had been infected and how the epidemic was evolving. And so, John, in your mind, what needed to happen so that governments and also health agencies could have more accurately estimated incidents of new infections, especially in those early months of the pandemic? I think in the 21st century, when we have diagnostic capability readily available, the best thing to do is to try to get uh, some sense of how widely the infection has spread, how many people are infected, uh, what is the proportion of people who are undetected uh, based on clinical symptoms. And I think that uh, it's very unfortunate that testing did not go very well, especially in the United States. Uh, the efforts at testing floundered with uh, CDC not really moving forward with uh, reliable tests. We had uh, uh, some countries that were doing better, like South Korea and Iceland, that uh, had very detailed testing. And uh, we, we had to do some proper seroprevalence studies very early on to understand how big is the proportion of the population 
that has been infected without these people noticing that they have been infected. That, that was the key determinant. If uh, there were very few people who had not been detected and it was very close to 3.4%, then yes, we were clearly in the range of uh, 1918. And that would be uh, something that would need a completely different approach compared to if we were in a much lower range of infection fatality rate and far more people having been infected without even realizing that they had been infected. And I understand that you originally supported the lockdown, but only as a temporary measure, and that it was actually your belief that by February of 2020, we'd actually already missed the window for nipping this novel coronavirus in the bud. So you wrote back in 2020 that you thought that if we acted earlier with aggressive testing, tracing, and isolating like the South Koreans did, and you kind of touched on this already a little bit, that we could have significantly slowed the spread of the virus. So do you still feel that way? I, I think that uh, my position in trying to support uh, aggressive testing may or may not have uh, been correct. Uh, if, if you look at the outcomes uh, now that we are three years down the road, South Korea eventually did get a major wave. Uh, it was not possible to, to control the virus forever, especially with variants that became even more infective and more easily transmissible. Countries like Iceland that I was, all, I was also proposing as examples of what to do in the early days also did get uh, apparently many people infected uh, downstream. But eventually, I think that their outcomes were pretty good. If, if you look at the excess deaths over three years, uh, countries like uh, Scandinavian countries, including Sweden, actually Sweden probably did best than, than anyone else, and countries like South Korea, did not really have excess deaths uh, to worry about. I mean, the calculations can be different with different assumptions, uh, but on average, we don't really see over three years any su substantial number of excess deaths. In many calculations, probably we even have a death deficit, which, which means that during the three pandemic years, uh, the number of deaths after you adjust for age structure were the same or fewer compared to the three pre-pandemic years. Conversely, countries that uh, really could not have any eyes on the virus and what was going on just, just lost track of, of what to do, when to do, uh, where to do. And obviously the solution of just keeping people locked for months and, and years was entirely impossible. So I did support lockdown for, for a few weeks to try to find out what we're dealing with and how major is the problem and uh, what kind of epidemiologic characteristic the virus has, what kind of uh, risk factors are associated with worse or better outcome, whom do we need to protect, uh, where do we need to intervene, what do we need to strengthen, but obviously the, the prospects of very restrictive measures that would be devastating for society, for mental health, for just the, the basic rubric of who we are and, and how we work and how we function in everyday life. I, I don't, don't think that that would be tenable. So, John, you wrote that the bulk of mortality related to COVID-19 occurred in people with limited life expectancy rather than young people. And you were, you were criticized for this, and you were accused of minimizing the lives of the elderly and even referred to as a heartless granny killer. Um, I'm just guessing that was hard for you to hear. Um, it also seems a little unfair because isn't it true that age is probably the better or does indeed predict mortality better than, than comorbidities? Age is an extremely strong risk factor for uh, morbidity and uh, mortality uh, in the setting of COVID-19. We had a glimpse of that even from the data from China very early on and, and the data from Italy. I wrote one of the earliest papers on what was happening in Italy in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine with colleagues from, uh, from Italy at the very early days. And I think that this is information that we should take in very seriously to protect the elderly, not to kill the elderly. Uh, so I think that once we knew that the major massacre was going to happen among the elderly age strata, even more so in nursing homes, even worse in people who were both old and had comorbidities, we had an obligation to do our best to really protect these people. So my thinking was, how are we going to protect these people in the best possible way? And of course, protect everyone. This was a major crisis and we had to protect everyone, both from the virus and from all the repercussions of what a pandemic can do in uh, all these other dimensions of health. I think it's very unfortunate that most countries did things that not only did not protect the elderly, but actually put them in, in the worst possible light of danger. We have evidence, for example, that nursing homes were infected disproportionately. They were infected more than the general population. 
and in in most high income countries, with with some exceptions, we had massacres in uh, in nursing homes that uh, to to some extent could have been avoided. And we also did very poorly in protecting uh, people who were not only at high risk because of their biological age and comorbidities, uh, were also disadvantaged. COVID-19 was a pandemic that created more inequalities, more inequalities in life and death affecting people who were already disadvantaged uh, based on the, the horrible inequities that we have in, uh, in our society. We, we just did very little or nothing to, to protect them. And uh, we basically tried to protect people like me who are healthy, wealthy, and can hide in my home. With respect to the nursing home phenomena, you know, there were some amazing stories. New York City really was a poster child in that respect, in a bad way. It's very unfortunate. And uh, the least that I'm interested is to promote or support or or start a a blame culture, because this is not how we will get out of this vicious uh, cycle. I mean, the pandemic has left this legacy of of thousands of wrong decisions. So I think it's, uh, it's not very constructive to just start blaming people. But it, but it is important to find out what went wrong and how it went wrong so that we can learn from these mistakes. Uh, I- indeed, when you have people who are I- infected sent to nursing homes and, uh, you know, creating the perfect storm environment to, to get nursing home residents massively infected, then that's going to lead to thousands and tens of thousands of deaths that, that could have been avoided. And so talking about, we're talking about the nursing homes, did you look into the nosocomial spread of COVID-19? So some patients were likely infected in hospitals by infected healthcare workers. And of course, this is a very controversial issue. Were you able to look at this at all? Uh, this is something that uh, was one of my very early targets in trying to make comments uh, and, and trying to help. Uh, and unfortunately, some of the work that I wrote uh, trying to attract attention on the need to decrease nosocomial infection and protect our hospitals could not be published because the, the environment was so toxic that nobody wanted to, to listen about it. But it's true that uh, we did not protect our hospitals. Actually, much like nursing homes, also acute hospitals in the early days were heavily affected. Uh, we had a number of physicians who died. We had other healthcare workers. And of course, we had all these susceptible patients uh, who were in hospitals who also got infected with bad outcomes. Uh, that didn't happen in every place. It happened in some places. What is worse is that it created a sense of insecurity and led many people who were not willing to go to the hospital, even for reasons that uh, they should go. So we had a substantial increase in excess deaths from people with myocardial infarction or other conditions that should have been treated in the hospital, but actually people did not uh, seek uh, that care. And of course, these are very serious diseases that have a very high mortality rate, and it is mortality rate that can be substantially reduced with proper treatment. So by panicking and by not creating a situation where people will feel confident that things are under control or should be under control, we created some major extra burden of, of disease and, and of deaths. Something we heard early on and hardly ever hear today was talk of flattening the curve. Do you remember it was, I think, two weeks to flatten the curve, and the idea was not to overwhelm hospitals. What did you think about the push to flatten the curve? I think, as we discussed earlier, I was uh, perfectly fine to, to try that for a few weeks until we could understand better what was going on and what were the basic epidemiologic characteristics of the virus and the pandemic spread. I think that uh, the calculations that led to the flatten the curve uh, theory uh, were completely wrong. They, they were based on assumptions of, of risk that were completely out of uh, the, the real range. And of course, if you assume that the impact is going to be 10 times bigger than what it eventually is, then of course, <laughs> you, you need to do your best to try to avoid that happening. Although the question is whether you can even succeed in this, because once you start re- relieving some of the measures, it's very likely that you will get back that same wave that you were trying to avoid. Right. So it's, uh, it's very unfortunate that this theory that had very little support in the epidemiological literature in the past actually probably no support, got propagated through social media, by influencers, by also a few scientists, most of whom had no real training in epidemiology and public health, and also a handful of experts who probably just lost their nerve. I I cannot believe that they would be fooled so easily and, and just move into this bandwagon. But you know, when, when you had influencers and media and social media creating so much panic, I can fully understand that they might have lost their nerve. Sure. And 
in a mathematical sense, of course, one can sometimes flatten a curve, but it doesn't change the number under the curve. It pushes the tail out. It makes a bigger tail out into the future. Indeed. And and eventually uh, you get all the negative repercussions of the measures that you're trying to suppress the curve with that are pushed out into a much longer period of, uh, of many years instead of uh, just a few weeks. Absolutely. So, John, we're curious, what did you think of the Great Barrington Declaration? Um, this is a paper that questions school closings, lockdowns, travel restrictions, and other government responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the authors of that paper, Dr. Martin Kulldorff, uh, was our guest on episode 132 of STEM Talk. And like you, he and his two co-authors recommended protecting senior citizens and others who were at most at risk of dying from COVID, while also allowing young people and others who face minimal risk of death to lead their normal lives. And also, like you, they were harshly attacked. So what are your thoughts about the Great Barrington Declaration? I think that there's uh, lots of uh, very uh, reasonable things in the Great Barrington Declaration. And um, I'm sure that Martin Kulldorff and the other people who signed it had uh, the best intentions. I, I think that the people who signed the opposite declaration, the John Snow Memorandum, also had the best intentions. So, of, of course, there, there can always be a few people who have conflicts of interest, but I, I don't think that their core that all these people who were fighting so vehemently to promote uh, one approach or another really just wanted to make money or, or gain something. I think that they were out there to try to help save lives. I did not sign the Great Barrington Declaration. I did not sign the John Snow Memorandum. And the reason for that was that even before the pandemic, I had published a paper where I had shown that signing petitions, declarations, open letters, memoranda, whatever, is not the way to do science and to make decisions in science. I, I think that in that paper I had shown by surveying people who had signed such a petition on a scientific matter, that most of them either had not read exactly what they were signing or their practices, what they were doing, were not congruent with uh, <laughs> what they had signed or did not understand what they had signed. So it, it becomes a, a very partisan game once you go down that path. There's also some element of coercion, even if you don't want to coerce people, if you're a very famous scientist, if you're dean of faculty, for example, and you say, I'm supporting this letter, younger people who are not tenured yet are feeling pressure that they need to sign along. And, you know, how am I going to go against my chair or my dean? People need to streamline their thinking and, and agree that these four or five or 10 bullets are really expressing what I believe. There's no room for nuance. There's no room to change your mind. I, I want to be able to change my mind and say, I'm, I'm really sorry. I made a mistake. I made a big mistake. And now I need to revisit it because I have better evidence. I have better data that point to the opposite direction. So I, I feel that a major problem during the pandemic was that instead of trying to do rigorous science, where it could be that one person is right and one million people are wrong. We just tried to create massive mobs of people who were just fighting in a partisan mode to support one or another theory. And that's very unfortunate. I, I think that uh, we could have done much better if instead of trying to create that partisan toxic environment, we could have... Uh, just said that we are all in the same boat. This is one world that we cannot divide into the good people and the bad people. Public health wants to save everyone, wants to help everyone. Uh, it's not a political party. We, we don't want to help just those who belong to one clan or one group or, or one political party. We want to, to help everyone. It's, it's very unfortunate that this did not happen. Yes, and, and this behavior, unfortunately, is not limited to COVID. Essentially, all topics deemed to be of importance are treated this way. You know, in today's world, we get this outrage, and outrage has become the favorite emotion for many people. And it's sort of propagated through social media and mainstream media even more generally. And it sort of becomes a force of its own. And it shuts down not only civil public discourse, but also civil academic discourse, which is really amazing. You and many others were certainly victims of this sort of media outrage and sort of a mob outrage for expressing opinions that were counter to the official narrative promulgated by the World Health Organization or the CDC or any number of other official or sort of mainstream outlets. Fostering fear and silence and dissent isn't healthy for science, as you said. Science, you know, the, the worst thing is to tell me there is a consensus on this. Science doesn't proceed by consensus. In fact, exactly the opposite is true. And you just made that point. A thousand people could be wrong 
and the one person that says no could demonstrate that they're right. But unfortunately, we live in very strange times where it's easy to feel like we've fallen through the looking glass, so to speak. If a topic is deemed important, and it's not just COVID, no dissent or difference of opinion, no matter how well-founded, is tolerated. Punishment is certain and swift. You've certainly seen this phenomenon up close, and uh, maybe if you, if you will, could you tell us about some of your experiences in this regard? As I said at the beginning, my, my personal experiences are, are completely negligible compared to what our, our whole community, what the entire world has, has gone through. Yes, I had uh, death threats. I had practically all members of my family attacked in, in one way or another, smearing, slandering, hit pieces, uh, social media portraying me as uh, Stalin <laughs> or uh, with, with very abusive uh, ways. All of that, I, I just try to, to leave aside because I think that many, many scientists suffered the same or similar uh, kind of attacks. Uh, there are surveys now that have been published in Nature and Science that show that for scientists who were involved in COVID-19 in one way or another, the majority of them got uh, one or more of these types of, uh, of attacks. And, and some people were even physically attacked. So this is completely horrible, not only for all these people. And I have to say, I feel more sorry for people who were attacked, who had the opposite opinions or opposite perspectives compared to mine. I, I, I wish we could have offered more time, uh, more visibility to people who had the opposite uh, perspectives compared to mine. I think that uh, what I worry is by worry more is uh, people who self-centered uh, because if if someone so someone like me or others who were thought to be pretty visible in in science be slaughtered like that you know they said uh, i'm i'm not going to say anything i'm not going to work on covid-19 i'm i'm just uh, going to to shut my mouth because that's not a healthy environment to be in i i want to protect myself i want to protect my family and that means that we lost a lot of wonderful scientists, a lot of very talented people who would have contributed very important work and have uh, would have saved probably lots of lives if they could have been involved. I think it's it's very unfortunate. It is. The self-censoring was huge. You know, I, I know a lot of scientists that when you brought up the topic, doesn't matter what side they were, that side thing is silly, but when you bring up COVID-19, it was just, oh, please. You know, they, they didn't want to talk about it and certainly weren't going to publicly talk about it. Even things they knew for years, like when it was proclaimed there was no such thing as, you know, acquired natural immunity. I don't know if you remember that whole discussion. Of course. But, well, you know, that, that's in undergraduate textbooks, and yet it was uh, unspeakable. So people were silent and they censored themselves. I, I do not blame them because the odds of uh, being successful and being heard under the circumstances were were very, very limited. I think the that uh, the punishment also was almost likely uh, to, to happen and, and be very harsh. So I, I think, again, I, I don't want to blame anyone. I, I prefer to blame just myself <laughs> for being so unprepared, in a sense, to, to deal with such a complex uh, situation, to deal with forces that have nothing to do with science, but eventually they influence science in, in major ways. I was very naive to think that uh, I would just behave as a scientist, just try to do research, just try to correct my mistakes and errors iteratively, try to arrive at better evidence. No, there, there were many, many other forces out there, far more powerful, far more vocal, far more influential. And uh, I, I, I felt completely unprepared and uh, powerless against them. Let's flash forward to January of this year, and we're going to talk about your paper, and it's titled Age Stratified Infection Fatality Rate of COVID-19 in the Non-Elderly Population, and this appeared in Environmental Research. And so in the paper, you pointed out that the largest burden of COVID-19 is carried by the elderly, which we've been talking about, and people living in nursing homes were uh, particularly vulnerable, again, as we've, we've talked about earlier in the podcast. However, 94% of the global population is younger than 70 years old, and 86% is younger than 60 years old. So in the study, you set out to accurately estimate the infection fatality rate of COVID-19 among non-elderly people in the absence of vaccination or prior infection. So John, first of all, we're curious, how did you and your four fellow co-authors come together to work on this study in the first place? This is a question that has occupied me since the very beginning of the pandemic. We did some of the early studies along with my colleagues at uh, Stanford and USC, 
in uh, Santa Clara County and in LA County, trying to understand the seroprevalence and indirectly the infection fatality rate for SARS-CoV-2. Then I started trying to perform a systematic review of that evidence because ma- multiple such studies were accumulating. A few months later in 2020, I published a paper in the bulletin of the WHO, which is the official journal of the World Health Organization, where my estimate for the infection fatality rate was uh, 0.23% at the uh, a global level for a median, but of course with uh, with very large variability across different countries. But the the most important question then was uh, how does that differ across age strata? We had strong evidence that it would be different in different age groups, and as more studies accumulated, uh, we continue to update our effort to get the most reliable, the most rigorous data. So that last paper is using what probably are the most rigorous data. These are national studies looking at representative populations that represent the general population of each country fairly well. You know, nothing can be perfect, but uh, this is why you need multiple such studies to be brought together so that you can see what the median and what the range might be and how much heterogeneity there exists. And we could look at age strata and estimate the infection fatality rate for data before the advent of vaccination. So our estimates were 0.0003% for the children and adolescents, 0 to 19 years old, 0.002% for 20 to 29 years old, 0.11% for 30 to 39, 0.035 for 40 to 49, 0.123% for 50 to 59, and 0.5% for 60 to 69. Now, this is a median. So some countries did worse than that. I think the US, for example, probably did worse than that. Some countries did much better than that. But uh, it it gives us a sense of what this virus does in different age groups and and what we could anticipate to have happened in terms of mortality burden if we had different percentage of the population being infected. So, John, in addition, your study also reported infection survival rates around the world. And you found that wealthy nations had infection survival rates of 99.962% for those under 60 and 99.902% for those under 70. However, in poorer nations, the survival rates are even better. So 99.992% and 99.988% respectively. And you and your co-authors speculate that lower obesity rates in poorer countries may have improved their survival rates. So how would the U.S. have fared if the obesity rate was at levels more common in the 1970s or even 1980s compared to now? I, th- I think that both the age structure and comorbidities uh, played a major role in eventually the footprint that we got of, of this pandemic. Low-income countries, if you take countries in Africa, for example, they have very young populations and their obesity rates in many of them, not all, uh, some like uh, South Africa have pretty high obesity rates, but many other countries have uh, not much of that problem. The same applies to India or some of the other countries that uh, had massive waves of uh, SARS-CoV-2. In the US, unfortunately, we had a perfect storm of number one, our age pyramid is uh, not the best. We have a lot of uh, elderly people who are highly susceptible to have adverse uh, outcomes. We have a very high proportion of the population who are very frail in, in nursing homes. And as I said, We didn't manage to protect those. We also have very high rates of comorbidities, in particular obesity, that are among the highest in the world. Not the highest, but among the highest. And that creates a a very sad undercurrent of uh, what you expect to get in terms of the toll of deaths in the country. On top of that, uh, we had all this mismanagement. We had all these people who died because of the measures that were taken or the lack of proper attention to the rest of the healthcare system. We had a lot of people dying because of not getting proper care. I mentioned uh, acute myocardial infarction as a classic example. We have an ongoing epidemic of uh, of overdose uh, from from drugs uh, and narcotics opioids that is horrible and that escalated during the pandemic it's very unfortunate but i think that many of the measures and the tension the panic the anxiety the stress the devastation the social devastation just made that problem far worse and and we have many many other reasons that our country unfortunately has a lot of inequalities. It has a lot of marginalized populations. It has a lot of people who have been chronically mistreated or not offered the best care or offered no care at all. We have lots of people who are uninsured. We have 
lots of people who were further marginalized and, and further hit during the pandemic based on the measures that we took. So you see that this is reflected, unfortunately, in the number of excess deaths that we see in the U.S., which is uh, completely out of range compared to practically any other high-income country that probably did much, much better than, than we did. Uh, you know, perhaps there's a couple that, that are close, but, but the average high-income country did much, much better. In many cases, like Scandinavian countries, like Sweden, the pandemic years, they had fewer deaths compared to the pre-pandemic years. They, they went through the pandemic without really experiencing a pandemic practically in terms of the death toll. Some of the countries where they were hit very hard, particularly early on, have very, as you noted, have very elderly populations. If you think of Italy and China, they're two of the oldest countries. And so it's, you know, it's, it seemed unsurprising that they would have such a bad outcome. Obviously, the, the age structure was, uh, was very influential, as we already discussed. And Italy not only had uh, one of the most elderly populations, I think that they were unfortunate that they were the first country in the high income group that were so hard hit and they just didn't know what to do. So they panicked. I think that uh, they had massive uh, disasters in their nursing homes in the early phases. They, uh, just didn't know what to do. I, th I think that uh, it, it's it's unavoidable that uh, when you're the first who goes into that mess, it's uh, it's very hard to blame that you didn't respond correctly. Mm -hmm. China is uh, is an interesting story. Uh, obviously, they were affected even earlier, uh, so they had the very first experience even even before Italy. And it's it's very unfortunate that the the flow of information between China and the rest of the world was not really optimal. We uh, have lots of concerns about what exactly happened in China. And you see that again, what happened in the last few months, for example, when uh, China eventually realized that the, the zero COVID strategy was a complete disaster and, and they had to just move ahead. And, and they did move ahead. But if you look at what they report as number of deaths versus what uh, different modeling approaches suggest as number of deaths, the numbers just make no sense. And, and I, I think perhaps the truth is somewhere in the middle. We, we published a paper with my team recently where we calculate the expected number of deaths in, in China after you remove zero COVID measures uh, and you have a massive Omicron wave. And I think that they're very likely to have been more than what uh, the Chinese government has uh, reported, probably less, though, substantially less compared to many of the modeling approaches that made uh, big waves in mainstream media. And they were done by people who are not really epidemiologists most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> they were, again, people who thought that they can work with data because they have worked with any type of data. This makes them also credible to work with, uh, with this type of, uh, of information. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research organization investigating a broad range of topics aimed at understanding and extending human cognition, locomotion, health span, resilience, and performance. So, John, your paper also noted that 44% of the population had already been infected with COVID-19 before Omicron arrived in the fall of 2021. And you went on to point out that an infection rate of 50% would have only caused modestly higher fatality rate than seasonal flu fatalities for those under 70. Can you expand on that? So this is a very rough calculation, but uh, if we have 50% of the global population infected before having access to vaccines, that translates based on the infection fatality rate per each age stratum. It translates to something like 2.5 million deaths of people zero to 70 years old. And uh, that includes uh, uh, roughly less than 50,000 deaths in people zero to 29 years old. So the vast majority is going to be in people 30 to 70 years old. How does that compare to flu? This is a question that unfortunately created a, a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of tension, a lot of partisanship. Yes, SARS-CoV-2 is not influenza. It's a different virus. But we should not underestimate influenza. Influenza is a virus that has led to several pandemics, a couple of them pretty devastating. It is 
with us every year. It has a major toll. When we look at younger ages, there's an estimate predating the advent of SARS-CoV-2 that influenza every year kills anywhere between 10 and 100,000 children less than five years old. So compared to less than 50,000 for zero to 29 year old, which would be the toll over a couple of years with COVID-19. So on average, the death toll of COVID-19 globally was probably much less than influenza for children and adolescents, and perhaps also some of the, the young adults. And we see that in excess death calculations in the countries that we have the most reliable data, which are high income countries, For the first two years, we saw mostly a death deficit in uh, children and adolescents. Uh, So we had fewer deaths in these pandemic years compared to the pre-pandemic years. Conversely, we, we do have a problem in people who are older, and we do have a superimposed problem because of all the disaster that comes along with the spread of the virus and with the measures that are taken. So eventually, we did lament a very large number of people dying But I think it's very likely that that most of these deaths were due not to direct infection from SARS-CoV-2, but due to the measures and the inability to deal with this problem in a reasonable way, in a constructive way, in a way that would minimize our losses. And this certainly challenges the fatality projections that were widely reported, um, especially in the first year of the COVID-19 outbreak. And around the time that you published your paper in STAT in March of 2020, the Imperial College of London actually predicted that COVID-19 would kill 40 million people. I remember that. Yeah. Yes. And, and what is worse is that that projection was uh, made to happen just uh, within a very short time horizon. So, of course, I have no doubt that SARS-CoV-2 will likely kill more than 40 million people. Perhaps it will kill billions of people if we do not destroy humanity and humanity lives for, for millions of years. You know, this is a virus that most likely will not go away. So even with a, a modest or low death toll every year, the numbers accumulate. Influenza has probably killed close to 2 billion people uh, during its presence among human populations. But it makes a huge difference when you talk about 40 million people within weeks or or a couple of months versus 40 million people over 10 years or, or 20 years. Miscalculations like this and others were particularly unfortunate because they prompted lockdowns and other heavy-handed responses from the government. It was, uh, it was near panic. Maybe it was panic. And as you wrote back in 2020, we needed data to inform us about the rationale of these measures, but people weren't looking at the data. At a minimum, you wrote, we needed unbiased prevalence and incidence data for evolving infectious load to guide decision-making. But that didn't happen. Why is that? In your view, why did that not happen? It's multiple reasons, and uh, it, it's multiple players, multiple stakeholders, many, most of them probably just acting in good faith and well-intentioned, but, but really under a state of fear and panic. I think that I had discussions with some of the scientists that uh, I admired in the past, and I felt that uh, they were very knowledgeable, uh, not necessarily in epidemiology, actually probably with very little or no knowledge of epidemiology. And I, I saw them that their, their thinking had completely derailed during these early days. And I, I, I think that when some of the most wise people get derailed, uh, you cannot expect that the average social media player, the average influencer, the average journalist in mainstream media, let alone in in conspiracy media, uh, the average politician, the average policymaker, the average public health official will manage to to keep their reason intact. I, I, I think that there was a crisis and people felt that if I'm in a position to do something, I need to do the maximum possible because otherwise... I will be accused that I did not do the maximum possible. And of course, that meant that uh, many of the things that were done were, were completely, completely out of, of scientific range, out, out of, of just common sense range, out, out of even just think <laughs> range. So I, I think that it's very unfortunate. Uh, decision makers, policy makers just lost their nerve. I think that uh, media and social media propelled that level of fear and panic and apprehension and partisanship to a higher level. Many people say that it was political 
perhaps, uh, but uh, in my experience, I think that if it were political, then it could be on the left, it could be on the right, it could be on any side of the political spectrum. I, I, I think that in my experience, some of the papers that I wrote were attacked by left wing commentators in some countries and by uh, right wing or alt right uh, commentators in, in other countries. So personally, I don't believe that that politics and power struggles should interfere with science. I think that science should be kept out of, of that horrible struggle just to try to inform society in the best possible way. But it was not easy to just inform society in the best possible way. There were just too many people who had very vocal ability to spread whatever they thought and whatever they believed. Hmm. Yeah, I uh, quickly shifted my thinking and didn't think much of the response had anything whatsoever to do with medicine or science. When you see organizations like Lancet and lots of prominent scientists saying that there's no such thing as natural immunity in the case of COVID on the basis of no evidence, I, I couldn't wrap my head around that. And, um, you know, more power to those who can. But uh, I, I'm not suggesting conspiracy. I'm just suggesting that it wasn't about science or about medicine. I think it will take a while to correct uh, the scientific literature on some major, major errors that, that were made. But I, I do believe that the process is there. I think that there's lots of scientists who now uh, realize uh, what happened and, and what is happening. Science is making errors. We make errors all the time. We make mistakes all the time. This is unavoidable. I, I consider myself as a scientist, uh, as a champion of, of mistakes. Mm -hmm. I, I don't pretend to be able to get everything right. Uh, I just hope that we can correct these mistakes and get to, to better mm -hmm. estimates downstream. You're more generous than I am. I don't regard these as mistakes when a prominent epidemiologist says there's no natural immunity. That doesn't sound like a mistake to me. Who knows what kind of, of pressure was uh, that epidemiologist under? <laughs> exactly. That's, that, that's what I was thinking. John, um, moving on a little here, you talked about the lockdowns and the mask mandates and the rest. You know, the, even well-intentioned mandates lead to unintended consequences. And I know you've thought a lot about this, and society is feeling the consequences now. Could you talk just a little bit about the unintended consequences that we're seeing as a result of the lockdowns and the school closures, for example, as well as travel bans? I think that the uh, unintended consequences are, are emerging now, and it's uh, worse that they will continue to emerge because many of them have a time horizon that is not acute. It is uh, midterm and, and long term. For example, we caused devastating damage to our children by school closures. Education lagged behind. Educational achievement uh, has been assessed, and it, it seems that uh, we kind of uh, went back uh, 20 years in, in the U.S. and perhaps the same or worse in some other countries. We did not give the ability to children to socialize for a very long time. We created a tremendous burden of mental uh, disease uh, in the younger generations, but also the older generations. We, we have a huge pandemic of mental health problems at the moment. We also did not manage to support our healthcare systems. Uh, so our, our health systems uh, might crumble, not because of COVID-19, but because of what we did to, to ourselves, of how we misstructured our response. We see tremendous problems with low-income countries. We, we see starvation escalating. We have about 1 billion people almost uh, who are in the zone of, of hunger. And uh, we know that this is a major source of mortality with about 8 million people dying because of starvation every year. And probably that number will go up. We have uncertainty. We have fear. We have instability. We have lots of countries that are now facing some very basic existential situations. And even high income countries, I think once you get down a death spiral, of uh, wrong decision making, you're likely to make one wrong decision after another. So we have that triplet of pandemic, hunger, and war that is very, very threatening and, and could really be devastating for our entire world. The future, no one can predict. And, and I think that it's never too late to reverse course, to try to say, okay, mistakes happened and they were horrible. But we try to, to move forward and try to help people, help people who are in need, help people who are weak, who are marginalized, people who are, are those who need more attention. 
and help all of us uh, eventually. We need we need more empathy. We need uh, more compassion. We need uh, more understanding of each other and a willingness to live with others who have different beliefs or different ideas or, or different understanding of how things might be. I, I, if, if we don't do that, I'm not sure that science can really help us. Uh, we, we may have the best science, but there's more than just science in trying to create a society that is thriving. You've published dozens of peer-reviewed COVID-19 related papers, and, and we'll have a show a link in our show notes to all of them. And you've said that, like all science, you expect some of these papers must have weaknesses. In hindsight, are there any weaknesses in these papers that stand out to you? I think that it's very likely that all of my papers have limitations and caveats and uh, perhaps errors or, you know, things could have been done better. I think that many of the papers that I published were iterative efforts to arrive at uh, better estimates and, and better conclusions. We discussed, for example, the infection fatality rate. I'm sure that the data that went into my first calculations were not as strong and as clear as the ones that went into the later calculations. I think this is part of science. This is how science should work. And I, I think that it's important to be able to revise our estimates to try to arrive at, uh, at more accurate and, and least biased uh, conclusions. I understand that you've looked at the recent study that was commissioned by the British nonprofit Cochrane, and uh, they do a lots of these uh, pretty exhaustive studies in most cases. And in this study, they found just sort of a meta-analysis, found no clear reduction in the respiratory viral infection as a result of mask mandates. The paper noted that the use of medical surgical masks, including N95 masks, were not effective in reducing the spread of acute respiratory virus. But they also said there was a high degree of uncertainty. The data isn't large and it isn't that robust. What are your thoughts about this paper? Cochrane has a very long legacy of working in systematic reviews and doing their best to try to procure the most reliable uh, systematic reviews on evidence that matters. Uh, so they're not successful all the time. I, nothing is perfect in this world, uh, especially in science, but I think that they're a very respectable group and their average review is, is very carefully constructed, very carefully conducted, and very carefully reported. I think that this is uh, another review that uh, is very well done. It is done by people who know what they're doing, and, and the process is, is very rigorous. Now, the, the interpretation, uh, unfortunately, has caused a lot of tension, and that partisan divide that we were talking before probably has uh, been uh, reactivated and has caused a lot of tension. Everyone, of course, is interested to know, do masks work or not? The data are, are not very conclusive. The estimates that we get suggest that it's very likely that they don't work, or if they do work, uh, the benefit is uh, relatively small or modest. Now, I need to apologize because my perspective had been that masks uh, would work, especially in situations where you have very high circulation of the virus, you have very dense exposures to many people in crowded places, and you also have strains that are very aggressive and also more lethal. Conversely, in, in situations where perhaps you are not in an acute epidemic wave, uh, you don't have a very heavy clustering of the population, and you have variants or you have background immunity because of vaccines uh, or natural immunity, then obviously, even if you do have a benefit, the benefit would be in absolute terms much, much smaller. In the current environment, based on that evidence as summarized by Cochrane, if you add the fact that everybody has been infected practically with very few exceptions, and many people have been infected two and three or perhaps even four times, Almost everyone has been also vaccinated. The variants do not seem to be that lethal. We mentioned the infection fatality rate at the very beginning of the pandemic. The infection fatality rate currently is way lower than that. It, it could be like a hundred times lower in, in some situations. In, in these circumstances, uh, I, I don't see that masks have a, a reason to be used right now. Now, a historical question, did they make sense at some point? <laughs> Goodness, what can I say? I, I, I think you have to go back and, and see what was happening. Even during these uh, very hot periods of, of debate, I was traveling a lot and I would go to places like Scandinavia, not just Sweden, but you know Denmark, and you would see no one wearing a mask. And 
you would go to other places and you would see everyone wearing a mask. So I, I would be in Germany in the very same building on the fourth floor. No one was wearing a mask in the fifth floor. Everyone was wearing a mask because the fourth and the fifth floor of the same building belong to different organizations. It, it's a huge mess. And I think the only way to make sure that we have a more reliable answer is to perform rigorous randomized trials. I'm, I'm very happy that we did some randomized trials. We, we did a, a trial in, in Denmark, another trial in Bangladesh, another one in Guinea-Bissau. Uh, there was another trial comparing plain masks versus uh, N95 in the Annals of Internal Medicine recently. Chapeau bas to, to these people who did these trials. This is exactly what needs to be done. And if we had taken think seriously, we would have had far more randomized evidence on that question and also on other questions that are so important to know about, not only for now, but also for the future. I did a 2021 Zoom discussion unrelated to COVID, you know, a technical discussion with a uh, high-ranking government official. This was in 2021. He was by himself in his office, in his home, wearing a mask. And uh, we, you know, I couldn't resist poking him some about that. And eventually he sort of laughed and said, yeah, it is ridiculous. But I'm told in all public appearances, even talking to one person on a Zoom, I have to wear the mask because it communicates something. It, it sends a message. I do worry that this is creating a further split in a society yes. that is already torn by all these partisan beliefs and let's say, superstitions in a sense. They, they, they're not torn by science. They're torn by superstitions. Exactly. And I, I do worry about that. I, I respect people regardless of whether they wear a mask or not. I, I, of I, course. I, I fully respect everyone regardless of whether they want to come to my class wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. I fully respect everyone if uh, they're in the airplane wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. If they if they walk in the street wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. I as, as an epidemiologist, I cannot advise them to do that. But at the same time, I realize that this is not just about containing a virus. Uh, it, it is psychology. It is mental health. It is uh, a surrogate. It is a statement. It is a personality. It is who I am or who am I not. Exactly. So I, I try to respect everyone, but it's important that respect does not move into trying to suppress, mandate, coerce destroy people with different views. Right. The, another thing I, I think on the mask issue with respect to the RCTs, the two studies you mentioned, and, and it's great they did them. The media it doesn't understand statistics at all, and they don't understand the difference between absolute risk and relative risk. And uh, when you see it portrayed in the media, it's, it's usually very badly handled. You see this in, in, you know, in pharmacology as well. And, and that's disappointing. It is disappointing. And I'm not sure whether one should blame the media because, I, I, again, I don't want to believe that media are evil and they just try to distort reality. It is the recipe of how they try to communicate information that they try to exaggerate right. and, uh, and point to probably the most clean and least uh, uncertain numbers. But mm -hmm. in science, most numbers are uncertain. And most numbers are not so exciting. Most numbers are very boring. They are what they are. <laughs> and it's, it's very unfortunate that these numbers are not attracting attention. Yes, I think it also has to do with the education. Today, the education of a journalist really needs to include a relatively sophisticated understanding of statistics. Not at the professional level, but, you know, reasonably good. And it's, it's not in the curriculums. And uh, so when somebody says something about a 10% relative risk, well, often the press release doesn't even use the word relative risk. It's natural that you don't have to attribute bad intent. It, it, it's just natural that they're going to get that wrong. I think that much can be said about how to educate journalists because they have a very important mission. What I did see during the pandemic was that journalists acquired far more power than scientists, and they acquired more power even in scientific journals. One analysis that I did, which uh, has been published as a preprint and it was recently accepted, so it will be also appearing um, in a scientific journal, was looking at journalists who publish in the top scientific journals like Nature, Science, uh, Bridge Medical Journal, Lancet, or JAMA. And what I saw was that there's many journalists who have published more than 200 papers in 
one of these journals. And in some cases, they have published more than a thousand. They have published like a couple of thousand papers in these extremely influential journals. Most of those might seem like news stories, but many of them are very lengthy. They're very uh, detailed. They may take more space than a regular article. And a journalist has an advantage when they go to publish in such a major scientific venue because they can publish whatever they want within a few hours of writing it. You know, the, the journal commissions, you know, they say, you know, write me sure. something about excess deaths or infection fatality rate or seroprevalence mm-hmm. or natural immunity or origin of COVID. Within a few hours, you can have a very long story in science, nature, BMJ, Lancet. And then, then what? You know, these journalists have set the agenda in a sense. They may have no clue about statistics. They may have no clue about epidemiology. They may have no clue about public health. In fact, I also looked at their credentials. You know, almost none of them has credentials on the topics that they write about, but they set the agenda. It, it would take me months to publish a peer reviewed paper and they take a few hours to set the agenda on what we know and what we don't know. And much of the time, even if they're the best journalists in the world, even if they're the best people, the the perfect intentions, they will get lots of things miserably wrong. Well, John, um, as we move toward the end of this interview, what are your thoughts about the possibility of future pandemics? And of course, there will be future pandemics and how this kind of situation that we have just went through, how this could be handled differently. You've kind of alluded to it through the whole interview. So could you give us like a concise view of that? I think it's uh, almost unavoidable that there will be some pandemics in the future unless we destroy humanity. (laughs) And I hope that uh, we do not destroy humanity and we do have the time in front of us to to witness other pandemics. We just need to not panic. We, We need to stick to the science. We need to get better data faster. Some of the data that we did not get early on are data that uh, we have the technology to get for many decades now. It's not that we were waiting for something to be developed, like what was happening, for example, with vaccines, that we didn't have a vaccine. And uh, we said, OK, we'll do our best to try to develop vaccines in, in record time, which which did happen. That's That's probably a plus. But much of the science does not have to wait for these new discoveries. Issues of characterizing the virus, its spread, its epidemiological footprint, who it affects, uh, where it is likely to have the biggest impact, mode of transmission, basic interventions, do they work or not, both treatments and biologics uh, and non-pharmacological interventions. We, we can test them with randomized trials and get an answer very quickly. I mentioned that we did not have randomized evidence for many of these questions of interest. But we also have some very nice examples like recovery and solidarity, which were large randomized trials, platforms of running randomized trials that they managed to get us answers to important questions on whether some treatments work or not within just a couple of months. So the the reasoning that uh, rigorous science takes a long time and we cannot do rigorous science, we just need to listen to whoever is screaming the most and uh, then have policymakers decide based on that screaming. That's horrible. We need to do rigorous science. Mm. We have the time to do rigorous science. Yes, some decisions need to be made very promptly, but they have to be revised based on the most rigorous science. And, And I think if we take that lesson, no matter what pandemics hit us in the future, hopefully we can do better. If we don't take that lesson, we are in for more disasters. Absolutely. And One of the challenges when you have something like a pandemic or or other sort of world-shaping events, you sort of know, if you're a scientist, you know the answer that the particular funding agency wants. And uh, this was a big problem. You know, you wouldn't, uh, good luck submitting a proposal of a certain kind, even if it was scientifically warranted to the government in the last few years on this topic, because it would get rejected out of hand. This is a major problem, and I think that this is one of the reasons why we had so many excellent scientists who self-censored and and or just went with the, the bandwagon effect. And now they regret it. But uh, I don't know. It, it's something that needs to change, change urgently. Yes, it, it couldn't agree more. And that brings up the topic of trust. We talked about it earlier a little bit. But trust or the lack thereof in institutions and the media has turned out to be a key factor in people's reaction to what you could think of as non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as lockdowns, mask mandates, vaccine mandates, all of these things. 
Understandably, surveys of trust have shown a substantial cratering, especially in the United States. At some future time, there may be strong negative consequences associated with this lack of trust between government institutions, the media, and a large segment of the population. Of course, this trust could be reestablished through transparency and accountability, but I'm not sure that will happen. Do you see this transparency and accountability, this sort of effort to restore trust, do you see this happening anytime soon? I cannot make a prediction because uh, it's it's not something that is uh, set in stone. It is something that people with their actions, with uh, with what they do, what they say, what they write can achieve. I think that it is important to reach reconciliation. It is important to maximize transparency. It is important to be open about errors and mistakes that were made. It's important to understand what exactly happened and to, to do it in a way that we don't try to blame each other, but uh, just try to understand what we did wrong and how we can avoid these mistakes in the future. Yes. We have lost the trust of a major segment of the population. And I think it's even more horrible that sometimes I hear, well, these people who lose their trust in science, they are conspirators, they are not well educated, uh, you, you know, they're, they're a lesser type of citizen compared to those who are supporting science. I think that that's that's really a recipe for disaster. In public health in particular, we want to help everyone. We, we Actually, if it is true, which I'm not sure that someone is less educated, we want to help that person more. If it is true that someone has less confidence in science, we want to give more opportunities to that person to really be convinced with arguments that science is trustworthy. So I think that uh, we are creating an explosive mechanism that is really fueling disaster at the foundations of science. If, if science becomes kind of an elitist type of uh, opportunistic engagement, where a few people just tell others that I know more than you do and you need to shut up, that's that's really horrible. Right. Then that's not science. That's just one type of, of dogma, dictatorship, absolutism, totalitarianism. It, it has nothing to do with the scientific method. So I do, I do worry about the scientific method being dismantled. I do too. Uh, assertions and consensus are not the means of science. And I, I think you said it very well. You know, we've been talking now for a while and Society will be thinking about COVID-19 and COVID, whatever the next one is, for a long time. I think, as you said, there'll be a lot of analysis, and it will not just be about the virus, but it will be about the societal response as well. In terms of your own research, what are the, wh where are you going with this? Do you have COVID-19 studies that you're working on or that you hope to pursue in the future? I do continue working on, on COVID-19 because I think that it was a major crisis, not only for the infectious disease component, but also for the major societal impact that it had. It is also at the epicenter of much of the work that I have been doing in meta research, uh, research on research, you know, how do we evaluate uh, research and research practices and how we do better science. So if I were to hide and not look at that monster in the eyes, I think that uh, I would not be dealing with what is the most important question about research practices and how we can optimize them. Of course, there's the risk also of uh, overemphasizing COVID-19, mm -hmm. and, and that does happen as well. As you mentioned, I have published so many papers, probably I have polluted the literature heavily <laughs> with my work. But uh, we also did an analysis of COVID-19 literature. We published the results in uh, uh, PNAS uh, recently. We saw that in 2020, 2021, 98 of the 100 most cited papers across all science were on COVID-19. Uh, this is another problem. You know, it's, it's important to study COVID-19, but even if it is, which it is a major crisis and a major problem and a major pandemic, I would have assumed that maybe two or three out of the top 100 papers across all science should be devoted to it. Now we've had 98 out of 100. So we've had an epidemic of attention. And I think that this should start becoming less, should become, become more nuanced, more tailored, more focused to data rather than partisanship and excitement and uh, overexcitement. Absolutely. And uh, well, John, this has been just terrific. You've been twice now one of our very favorite guests on STEM Talk. 
and we really appreciate you taking the time to join us. So thank you very much. John, it's been so great speaking with you today. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Have a wonderful day. Yes, you too. STEM Talk. 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 Well, Ken, this interview has certainly given us all a lot to think about. And when John published his paper in early 2020 that questioned the reliability of the information that he was seeing about the prevalence of COVID-19, I mean, he received death threats, as he mentioned. And I remember seeing a lot of this in in the media at the time. And he was also demonized by many professional colleagues. But with his paper, he just published on the pre-infection fatality rates in the non-elderly, which should have generated quite a bit of scientific discussion. There's hardly been any discussion at all. And all those people who are so quick to judge and demonize John don't really seem to have anything the same right now. And I, I find that disappointing. I think that that note about scientific discourse is, is so important. I think it's something that we should definitely maintain in the scientific community. Yes. Um, and you notice nobody says, I'm sorry, or I was wrong. People have boxed themselves into such extreme positions. There's no room to reevaluate. Yes, yeah, very rare. So it is really disappointing. As John pointed out, the reaction to the pandemic was a fiasco on so many levels, which had major impacts on people's lives and the economies of the world. John's main point back in 2020 is still the main point he makes today. Data, not guesswork, or even worse, politics, should drive public health decisions. In science, there's no room for sacred cow narratives or censorship. I feel a great deal of gratitude for John hanging in there, despite the abuse he receives. Yes, I agree, Ken. And if you enjoyed the interview as much as Ken and I did, we invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes at stemtalk.us. This is Don Cornegas signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.